Hey guys, this is KT and Mr. Quinn. Welcome back to our movie podcast. Today we will be covering The King. <laughs> yes, welcome back, guys. Uh, so The King, as some of you may know, was released by Netflix for uh, the 2019 season. Um, it has uh, overall a 7 out of 10 score. Um but it's, it's a little divisive. Uh, for those who aren't aware, it is based on the Shakespearean plays about Henry the Fourth and V. Uh, so some of its historical inaccuracies come just from being based on that. Uh, and some of the characters who appear are only there because it was based on the Shakespearean plays. Um, David Mashad was the director, Joel Edgerton and David Mashad were the writers. Um, its top billing were, um, or not top billing, sorry, top, uh, well yeah, top billed stars were, um, Timothy Chalamet, of course, uh, Robert Pattinson, and Joel Edgerton. Um, and we'll get into who exactly they played when we get there. Uh, it's interesting to see that Brad Pitt produced this movie. <laughs> yeah. It... I was just watching the credits. I was like, oh, hi, Brad. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> I mean, I'm... I've, I've noticed him doing, <laughs> like, weird, weird things lately. So, um, it does have a few awards. Now, because uh, it was released during 2019, it'll be in the 2020 award cycle. Uh, however, Australia has already started. Um, so, it won Best Cinematography, Best Supporting Actor for Joel Edgerton, Best Production Design, and Best Costume Design at the Australian Academy Awards for cinema and television. Um, and then it got a lot of other nominations as well. Um, but right now, those are the highest acclaims that it received. Um, so to kind of get into it, um, this story is uh, mostly focusing on Henry V and how he came into power and what he did once he was uh, on the throne. Now, um, it, it closely follows his attitude toward and relationship with war, um, and, and just kind of how that plays out. Historically, Henry V was far less of a pacifist than our wonderful King Hal is in the movie. Um, I know, he's a sweet being who's determined for peace, and I was like, I highly doubt that's how he actually was. Yeah, it's, it's highly <laughs> unlikely. Um, now, he... It, Historians are a little in disagreement on how pacifistic he was at the beginning of his reign. Um, because yes, he did go to war with France, and once he was at war with France, he was determined to take it, you know, all the way to ruling France. Um, and eventually it was his decision and his idea, not a bishop's, to um, go all the way to Jerusalem. But his issues with his father um, were very real, and um, and so there's a little bit of, of disagreement on whether or not he started off a little more pacifistic than he ended up. But hot blood definitely seems to uh, run in that family. Do you want to go into full depth on this movie, or or what, with the story? Um... Because, I mean, it's... it's I, I don't see, again, I don't know how close it is to the play, though, because I don't know the works of Shakespeare that well. 
I only know a few of them. <laughs> yeah, so I I am not a I'm not very familiar with the histories. Um so I I did a little bit of research this morning. Um and Falstaff is one of uh Shakespeare's uh creations. But is he I well I figured that yeah. much. Um and he in the in the play, he's not ever a confidant. He's only um uh, comic relief. Yeah, which what? I'm kinda glad I'm kinda glad in this movie he's more of a he's, rounded he's more like a pro yeah, he's a more well-rounded, kind of more down-to-earth character, because he, he, because Joel Edgerton, from what little I know him of, he is a very good actor, and I really enjoyed him in that oh, role. Oh, for sure, he did magnificently <laughs> yeah. in that role. Yeah, yeah. Um. Just a big, beardy boy. Yeah. So regarding how, how in-depth I want to go, um, I think, I think in, this one is going to be kind of more of a surface level because neither of us are history buffs. Um, and I've also, it, neither of us have, have really read the plays that it's based on. Um, yeah, and I think both of us have only seen this once as well. I don't think this is one that we had a chance to do multiple viewings. No, I've seen it twice. <laughs> Yeah. I had okay, all right. That helps a little because I was only able to watch it last night. Yeah, or well, I've seen it like one and three quarters times. Um, so we go from, you know, him trying to stop the constant wars that his father has ravaged the land with, um, to him having to take the throne because his brother was similarly, you know, bloodthirsty and eager to prove himself and then um you have these multiple provocations by france um that end up leading to uh war and henry v uh historically was known for his military strategy and prowess and aggression um, and being very, very good at war. Um, and you see some of that in this movie. Um, but he definitely comes across a lot more as a pacifist and as someone who can listen to his advisors and then make a decision. Um, and he makes the right decisions uh, to succeed in his goals, um, but the the actual you know strategist of Henry V is not not terribly actualized in the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he's more so he's more so just painted is kind of a kid who's like, I really don't want to do this, but he's obviously more intelligent than his brother. Mm -hmm. But because he's so... Because he defied his dad so... Because he defied the king so much, the king is like, no, I'm going to put your little brother on the throne, and then, of course, the eventuality happens where he has to take it. And the, the juxtaposition from his... From the two opposing sides of his character are actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's a nice. I don't know how accurate that is to the um, the Shakespearean, it, it, the Shakespearean play, the original. But I like how he, how he went from being just kind of this this really not bratty, but this really like uh, like lethargic, like like just uninterested individual to being very like but, ah, what's the word I'm trying to think to being very focused on the fact that he has to be king. <laughs> yeah. It um, it's very interesting. I, I don't know how it compares to the play either, but that part of it, uh, lines up with history, um, yeah. according to the, the articles that I've read. 
because Henry V was known for his, you know, rampant debauchery and just general lack of responsibility. Um, his ascension was called into question by multiple people because of his past. So that part is accurate. I would hazard a guess to say that Shakespeare probably included it as well, just because yeah. that's something that's really easy fodder for Shakespeare to exploit. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I don't know anything about it, and that's what he usually did in his so-called comedies, quote-unquote. Yeah. Um, so, once he's on the throne, he's he's very intense. Um, he gets the, uh, you know, the, the monk-inspired haircut, which is historically accurate. Every painting that we mm -hmm. have of Henry V had that hideous haircut uh, but uh are you telling me bowl cuts aren't in anymore huh? are you telling me bowl cuts aren't in anymore <laughs> it, it, bowl cuts should never be in never <laughs> cannot convince me ever that someone looked good in one uh... timothy comes very close but that's just because he's got such a good face. I know, he's sweet looking. Yeah. Uh, so from that point on, he's, you know, initially reluctantly at war. And then he's like, okay, well, we're at war. We're following this all the way through. We might as well. Um, and he retrieves Falstaff to be his advisor. Um, William, who's played by the great Sean Harris, uh, is also advising, but he was advising Henry the Fourth as well, um, and is definitely a warmonger. Um, but he, he delivers one of my favorite lines in the movie, um, He's talking to Hal about the um, about how the people view him and view you know his his reactions to um, the French provocation and. Uh, and he says that the general mood of the people is that Hal is too weak. And Hal is like, well, I'm not being weak. And that's when uh, Sean Harris delivers the line, this mood may be a fantasy, but that does not mean that it is not felt true. Yeah. And that's, that's my favorite line in the movie, having watched it twice. Um... I love the dialogue in this movie. It's really good. It is really Again, good. I don't know how close. I don't know how close it is to the Shakespearean dialogue. It didn't sound very Shakespearean to me because I know Shakespearean dialogue, but the dialogue in this movie. I think it was a few episodes ago. We were talking about how people get upset when movies aren't historically accurate with their dialogue. <laughs> this is a movie where I'm okay where they're historically accurate with some of the dialogue <laughs> because it really needs it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Um, so, very, very well done, um, in general, the, the moment that Robert Pattinson comes on screen as the, uh, oh, hi, Robert. Yeah, so. <laughs> I forgot he was in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I just get in all caps, LMAO from Atticus uh, as as they're watching followed by Hello Robert Pattinson and I was <laughs> I forgot who's in the movie <laughs> and I mean it, I, I didn't even realize that he was in the movie um, so I'm watching and suddenly he comes up and I'm like wait 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 is that what <laughs> 
I really want to give him a chance now as an actor because I mean I obviously I had no affection and just all hatred for the Twilight movies. Yeah. <laughs> for knocking cinema back like ten years. Yeah. But but the fact that he's actually gone out of his way to be in like movies like this and like the lighthouse <laughs> and like a bunch of other stuff shows that he really is committed to wanting to be an actor. Like it's something he really wants to do. And he's only in movies like this. Now he doesn't do mainstream movies anymore. He will only do weird fucking movies. And I, well, and I'm starting to have a lot of respect for him now again, now as an actor. And what's interesting is that there are actually a lot of people who did not realize it was Robert Pattinson until they looked him up. I I knew it was him. You can't. It's his eyes. <laughs> it, yeah, like he he has a very distinctive face. He's like Tom but... Baker. He's all eyes and teeth. <laughs> mm -hmm. He really is. So like I recognized him immediately, yeah. but he does a very good job of masking his usual voice um and of adopting the accent so I, I think that's what threw most people off because you and i have a much better like recall for faces yeah. um yeah. than most people do and you know you have the long hair and uh and all of that but um i really loved his his depiction of the dauphin um it it just and every time he and Timothy as Hal were on the screen together was just it, you know they had great um great banter great chemistry um absolutely loved them yeah. together on the screen but, um, yeah, so the, the movie, um, the movie basically follows through to the end of that war, his, uh, betrothal to the princess of France and, um, the, uh, the subsequent unraveling of um, some machinations and manipulations that caused him to go to war in the first place. Yeah. Now, knowing history as we do, we know that he would have gone to war with France, even if it weren't for those things. Um, my personal opinion is that probably he was initially hesitant because he loudly criticized his father for destroying the country with war. Um, but once, once he got started, he was, he was going to finish. Well, the whole, but... the whole, um, the whole kind of, I don't know, what's the word I'm thinking of? The whole, like, issue he had with his, with his father, with King Henry the Fourth, is that basically because of Henry's madness, which I know a tiny bit about Henry, I mean, most English kings did this. He ended up dividing the country because he was just constantly, mm -hmm. he was constantly at war with like the dukes and all the different um, aspects. Like he was in, he was in war, he was at war with Scotland. He was at war with Wales. You know, anyone who didn't like a hundred percent follow him was, was considered a traitor. And so he had basically just destabilized the entire kingdom in Henry, in Hal's, goal was to re was to bring union back and that's what he ultimately wanted and that's why they convinced him to go to war with france because they're like hey if you do that everyone will will fight under one banner and he's like yeah but i don't want to cause more bloodshed and what was it oh i can't remember what it was william said something about promises <laughs> but yeah that's that's the whole yeah that's kind of the whole thing that starts the war with france it, it, besides mm -hmm. the whole the the taunting and the and the supposed right. attempted assassination, right? So um, the the attempted assassination is the the conspiracy that gets unraveled there at the end, and it turns out to have been William the whole time. Um, so 
uh, he he ends up getting executed, and that's kind of how we end the film. He doesn't get executed. Um, he gets stabbed in the head. <laughs> that's that's a form of he execution. Stabbed in the head. I was like, oh, who? <laughs> Okay. Uh, this movie actually isn't very... that violent, but sometimes it has some really punchy scenes in it. <laughs> it yeah, it does. It's like it when it goes for violence, it goes all the yeah, way for violence. Yeah, it uses it very effectively. <laughs> yeah, um, which I like. You know, it it gives the movie that gritty feel without giving it the dragging through the mud feel that gritty films also often give. Which is ironic because this uh, this movie has a battle that takes place in mud. <laughs> that was intentional. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm saying it for the audience. <laughs> we have to understand uh, some people might be listening to this and not watching the movie, and not seeing the movie. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Recording was too loud. Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Why was it too loud? Oh, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know. Um. So pacing is pretty good in my opinion. Um. The, the beginning is very slow. Yeah. But the Henry the Fourth plays are supposed to be much slower than Henry V. Again, I haven't read them, but they uh, they are known to be much slower. Um, How many days are we talking <laughs> in terms of Shakespearean slowness? <laughs> How many days? Yeah, his plays used to... He used to do, like, week-long affairs. <laughs> yeah, well, Henry the Fourth is, I think, in two parts. So probably two days. Yeah. Because yeah, he used to do the parts in days, because it was like they... That was, like, how they used to do stuff back then. It's like, it was like daytime television. Mm -hmm. I only found that out because yeah. I was watching Upstart Crow, which is a really funny show Ooh. with uh, David Mitchell. <laughs> And okay. the Steven, the husband, actually knows about some of that stuff because he is English. And so he actually learned about Shakespeare the way you're supposed to, not how American kids did, where we read Romeo and Juliet and get really frustrated with it. <laughs> yeah. So anytime there was any kind of reference, I'm like, can you please explain? And he would tell me. So that's the old, so that's where I got all my knowledge. So listeners can take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> I learned it from a Ben Elton comedy show that has Twitter jokes in it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the show's really funny. Maybe a few grains of salt. <laughs> you should watch but, that uh... show. It's pretty funny. <laughs> okay. This is accurate yeah, because we... it's Shakespeare. <laughs> I'll add it to my list. Okay, <laughs> um. But yeah. So the the pacing was pretty good once uh hal ascended um it was it, it's a fairly slow start um i'd say it really picks up what like 30 45 minutes in I, yeah because i think i think his ascension to the throne is about the 40 minute mark this movie's like two hour and 20 minutes long so about a two hour 12 two, yeah so about a third of the way through it picks up yeah, and it's not boring. No, no. Um, before that, it's just compared to the rest of it, the pacing of the first third is very slow. Yeah, well, the the first the first act is kind of more so about is about more so about um Hotspur about Percy, and then the yeah. eventual his eventual demise happens, which uh, the combat between Percy and Hal is actually 
fairly accurate to how something like that would go, and the fact that he doesn't, like, run in through with his sword and he just kind of manhandles him and stabs him with his dagger is very accurate to how actual knight fighting happened. And as soon, yes. as, the, as, soon as I heard that they were going to fight, I was like, all right, this is where KT's knowledge of things can come into play. And I sat there and I watched it and I looked at the armor in the combat and I was like, oh, this is fairly accurate to a... To a certain point, there is some embellishing in certain spots, mostly on the armor design, but this movie is mm-hmm. really good to look at. Despite how earthy it looks, it, a lot of the design is consistent. So, like, um, Robert Pattinson's character, he has very, orga- very ornate looking armor, which I don't really think someone would have, but because, but because, like, Timoth, because, like, um, Thomas and how both had armor like that like it doesn't really bother me as much <laughs> they tried to keep the or they tried to keep that that look consistent yeah, yeah. It, it was uh kind of their way of identifying for the audience yeah this person is royal this person is not yeah and it was um which like i get it is embellishment. It's not going to be, you know, if you were to travel back in time, you're not going to see that shit. But it makes sense to give, you know, that little creative twist to things to make it clearer for the audience. Yeah, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I really like the armor design in this movie. It's really pretty. It is. And really just in general, the costume design is on point everywhere you see. Yeah, for the... It may not be 100% historically yeah. accurate, um, but it lends authenticity to itself by feeling and looking historically accurate. Yeah. Um... So there's there's not much makeup effects in this movie. It's mostly you know, all right, we're gonna slap some mud on just you. Congratulations. Of, just a lot of mud and just dirty, dirty peasant people. So just a lot of dirt yeah, and, and wigs and wigs, lots of wigs. <laughs> um, and lots of really bad haircuts that unfortunately are a hundred percent accurate. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so makeup, costuming, absolutely fantastic. Um, the cinematography is just gorgeous. I like... Even during the bi- the battle scenes. Yeah, I liked, I liked how, um, I liked how down to earth the camera was. It, it mm-hmm. let you, because the camera was so stationary for the most part, to just give you these nice, like, wide shots and these really good intimate close-ups... It was a lot easier mm-hmm. to see. That's what makes it easier to keep up with the movie is because the camera lets you breathe. Even during the battle scenes, like there's a certain scene where it where there's like just this mass chaos and it pulls out on the chaos. But because mm-hmm. the camera pull out is so slow, you can just take in like the the entirety of that scene and you're like, oh crap, this is getting really bad. And the Towards the end, whenever Hal actually joins the fight, the camera following him as he like goes through the when he like he like goes through combat and then he like goes under the horse, he narrowly gets like his head chucked off. Like that mm-hmm. whole scene, that whole tracking shot is just so well done. And it manages to focus on him on like so easily. I was like, that's really good. <laughs> I'm proud of y'all. Y'all yeah, the... took your time on this scene. I'm glad. <laughs> For sure. The director of photography on this is just absolutely fantastic. Um, let me see. Where is the DP? Yeah. You will probably... That's more... Adam Arkapa. Has he been in anything that you've seen? Because you've seen a heck of a lot more than I have. I recognize the name... Um, let me see. Oh, he was DP for eight episodes of True Detective. Not seen. 
and top of the lake. Let's see. Um, oh, he was DP for. Oh no, that's the short, not the full. Never mind. Um, so mostly he's DP'd shorts, um, but he does have a documentary background, so it makes sense that he would film it in such a static way. Yeah. Um, yeah. there's one thing that I really like about documentaries is that for the most part, it's the eyes of an observer or an engager yeah. and in this case most of the shots you feel like you're there you feel like you're breathing the same air and so when it pulls out it's almost like you're having an out-of-body experience and then going back in yeah that, that's um, why i said it felt very grounded the camera yeah. the camera felt like a person for most of the part which is how cameras should be. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, very, very good job on that. Um, the lighting was pretty good. It, it's a lot of outdoor scenes, which are really difficult to control the lighting on. There's a lot of dank, cloudy England. <laughs> it's a very yep. gray movie. <laughs> it is a very gray a very movie, gray movie, but... <laughs> Between color correction and um, the lighting on set, they they definitely did a very good job because, for one, it never feels artificial. Yeah, the color in this movie is very good. Mm-hmm. And two, it you you don't have anyone getting shiny when they shouldn't be shiny. Yeah, there's no weird lighting, like under lighting or anything like that. Like all of the lighting in pretty much every scene looks like looks like the lighting that you can see within the shot is the lighting they use. Because like during the scene where like after his after his like inauguration where he's where he's crowned, they're all at this big mm -hmm. feast and they're like giving gifts and they're just having merriment and there's like tons of fires. And like torches and everything lit, but he's still very dark because it's a big room, and it's like it could have been mm -hmm. really easy to just put like a like an underlight on him, but no, they kept it dark. Like there's certain scenes where it's just very dark, and I was really happy about that because it's a more it's a more realistic approach to lighting, which a lot of movies are scared yeah. of doing, and I'm glad this one wasn't because even Quentin Tarantino does that crap. <laughs> His weird, <laughs> his weird overhead lights that come from nowhere that he does in every movie. Yeah. Uh, magnificent, uh, Hateful Eight is the most egregious of that. <laughs> it is. It's funny, though, because it's like, where the hell uh, is a super bright spotlight coming from? <laughs> that bothered me so much watching that movie. Uh, it's still a good movie, um, though. <laughs> yeah. But that that in particular drove me crazy. Yeah, but um, the foley work in this is really good as well. Um, I think they mostly used sounds from set. Um, but there's not a moment in the movie where you're going, okay, what is that sound? Where is that coming from? And there's also not a moment going, where is that sound? There should be one. Why isn't it here? So, um, I, I'd say they they did a solid job there as well. Mm -hmm. And the music in this movie is very good. I actually yes. really like. I don't recognize the composer, but I really like the the the, the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It's really because in a lot yeah. of movies like this, the soundtrack becomes like more incidental than anything else. Or it's just for there for the sake of having music, but I would listen to the soundtrack of this movie without the mu without the movie, because it is it is a very good. It's because I I noticed it throughout the whole time, and it sets the like the atmosphere and the mood of every scene really well, mm -hmm. without being too abrasive. Has this guy done any other yeah. movies I've seen? 
Um, looking at them, I don't think so. He's done. He, okay, so he's he's done a few nudies that are on my list, but not. Okay. Yeah, not. Yeah, because um, Moonlight is on here, and I haven't seen Moonlight. Yeah, big, I haven't seen that one either, so we should definitely do the it. The Big Short is one I also have on my list. Twelve Years a Slave, I haven't seen. Yeah. Battle of the Sexes. So, he's, he's a, yeah, there's a lot of movies on here I want to see that he's done, so I'm curious to see how he tackles other, other genres, <laughs> other other themes yeah because his the way he approached the mu the music for this movie is very good it is um this is rounding out to be a short one yeah i mean the thing is is because the, this is a really good movie but we don't have enough knowledge on the subject itself to really talk yeah. about it um Without making ourselves into asses. Yeah, and without <laughs> reciting the entirety of the like the Wikipedia article, which I don't want to. It's like mm -hmm. so this I can understand why this movie ha might have the lower score that it does if you more into the source material. Like the historical source material and the dramatization source material, which is the that it is technically an and and a loose or weird adaptation of the William Sha of the Shakespeare play. So I mm -hmm. guess if you know those two aspects, that's probably why it has its lower score. <laughs> but as someone watching a movie who knows very little about the source material, but knows enough about, like, period accuracy in terms of just, like, of, like, environment, characteristics, design, com like, war, like, combat and things like that, it it's a really good movie in terms of all of that. Like... Like I said, it for is. the most part, the armor is fairly accurate. It is embellished a little, but that is fine. Um, a lot of the combat tactics are very accurate. Like, the fact that Hal, when he goes into that final battle, has a hammer and not a sword made me so happy. <laughs> because a ha Here's the deal. Here's the deal, all you medieval people who think sword, sword and board is cool. Swords are very, very good weapons, but they're very clumsy weapons in most forms of combat. Knights were very akin to samurai. Samurai did not go into battle using swords and killing people. They would most likely have pikes. Swords were for one-on-one -on -one combat, and it's the same with knights. Mostly, knights would use one-on-one -on -one combat. In this movie, they they um they very accurately say that using our bow our bowmen are much better. Than than any than any Frenchman with a crossbow. I guess that's very accurate. <laughs> and yeah, like I said, the fact that he went into combat with a hammer is much more accurate than him going in with a sword, because he already had his dagger on him, which every knight carried a dagger because the dagger was the most deadly weapon to a knight. But he, the, a hammer, because it is a smashing weapon, if you go at someone with full plate armor on with a hammer and you know you're faster than them, you can kill them much quicker because you can basically oh, use yeah. their armor against them because he was just bashing them in the head, which will kill them a lot quicker because they're wearing a metal helmet. <laughs> And in yep. yeah, and some of the combat during the battle with Percy and when John is doing some of his combat, they do he, they did the um the two handed sword like the the kind of like double the double grip sword techniques where you use your sword as mm -hmm. more of a more of a bashing weapon than so much a slashing weapon. And as soon as I saw, it, I was like, yeah, the guy they got to do kind of the the like um. I guess choreography, <laughs> the choreography for like the battles and how they should, how they should walk and how they should, um, you know, act when in combat. I was like, yeah, that's this there. I've seen more, I've seen movies do it more accurately, but this movie did a really mm -hmm. good job with it. And it could have just been very much a dudes with swords crashing into each other and then fancy fighting and stabbing and people going, Ugh. <laughs> But no, yeah, the, the combat so, uh, was very accurate. <laughs> yeah, so a shout out to Jan Petrina. Good job, man. Yeah.
Again, I have intermediate knowledge on that. I'm not 100% of an expert, but I know enough to feel confident to talk about it. Yeah. And because cause the, whole, the whole idea on how they would win the Battle of Agincourt is it's raining, it's going to be very muddy, those horses and that armor is going to be really bad. And of course, when Robert Pattinson's character appears... He's like, we will fight, and then he's slipping and sliding everywhere because he's wearing big, heavy armor, and he can't do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's just like, and then Hal's like, yeah, no, I'll get him, and they just murder him. <laughs> oh, yeah. That scene was so... No mercy whatsoever. Yeah, that was a really good scene, because that's how that would have happened. It's like it's mm -hmm. like the king wouldn't have even attempted to try to take his life. He'd be like, you know what? I killed so many of your men. You're making a fool of yourself. I might as well just let my men have an exter an extra victory by murdering you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I did enjoy a lot of that. They didn't glorify battle like a lot of these movies do. They very much always talk about how war is soulless and in how it's always dirty and soulless and things like that. And that was good because his brother in, of course, King, um, the King, the King of Forehand, um, Henry the fourth tried to glorify it. Whereas, yeah. And same with Percy, it's same with Percy, but Hal and John, you know, were the two that really understood that, no, this is messy business. This is why we don't want to do it. And I, I yeah. really appreciated that. Like very good, very good fight scenes, like very good um, camera work within those. They're not messy or hard to follow, but they did a good job of not like glorifying it. There is no like triumphant victory, and it's just like we won. There's bodies everywhere. It's awful, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I would give this a like eight and a half out of ten stars I don't, uh, I don't feel like rating it i don't really think we should do a rating system okay i think this is a movie worth watching though like if you if you want to watch something that's a lot if you want to watch something that's more down to earth and a, a lot easier to follow than some of these dramas can be because some of these like historical Quote unquote drama or quote unquote historical dramas can be a little harder to follow because they can be just agonizingly slow. This one mm -hmm. I did not have that problem. The character, the character interaction, um, the character interaction, like the the pacing, the character interaction, and a lot of the um, a lot of the um, dialogue is a lot easier to follow than a lot of these kinds of movies, because that was the issue I was going to have. I was like, oh god, am I going to be able to follow this the dialogue? Because when I watch movies like this, I have to translate the dialogue into my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because they, they are speaking just a very, very different form of English. Yeah, so overall, definitely a good watch, especially if you like... Um you know, dramatizations, um, and biopics, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very good one. Um, my, my biggest gripe is just that first, like, third of the movie. After that, I'm pretty happy with yeah. it. So, uh, so yeah, it really, really good, um, just, all around and and like I said, the only issue I really have with the first third is that compared to the rest of it, it is so much slower. Yeah. Um, yeah. but if the entire movie had the same pacing as the first third, I wouldn't have it, any issue with it. No. So it's just it's a weird like, you know, it's a weird jump, but. It's not problematic. It's just, oh, this is okay. Things are happening now. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just say watch it. Do you have any it. other? Just watch it. It's yeah. a good movie. It's a, ne it's a Netflix movie, and Netflix has been making some really good stuff as of late. So, yeah, just, just watch it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Just watch it. If, you, if it's something that you've been kind of wanting to watch, but 
you know, listening to this makes you want, like, change, kind of change your mind, then yeah, just just watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, this was my second watch, and I enjoyed it as much as my first. Yeah. That's good. Um, anything, so, yeah. anything different that you kind of noticed from the first time to the second time? Um, I noticed a lot more of the just the subtle acting. Um, there are a lot of like body language shifts mm-hmm. and um, micro expressions that that the actors in the background do that are just fantastic. Um, so even even outside of the primary cast, this was really well performed. Yeah. Um, and those those micro expressions and those shifts in body language are things that a lot of the time extras don't do. Um, and that's sometimes what makes an otherwise solid film feel a little detached. Well, you got you got to give the English one thing or the Europeans, they will always do these these um these sword and board historical things or these sword and board medievals justice when it comes to that kind of acting because if there's one thing an Englishman can do, it's a medieval play. <laughs> they're all yes, they're all is. born with the ability to do it and they all do it. They all did Shakespeare and all of these people did Shakespeare in school. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all know how to ride horses like it's a requirement so anytime i see a movie like this that has a fairly like strong european or strong english cast I'm like yeah this will be a good movie it's yeah. not gonna bother me if it's got an american in it then i get kind of worried but if we ever talk about ironclad the only reason i like ironclad is one because it has brian cox in it and two because paul giamatti is the best thing in that movie <laughs> he is the best part of that movie and it's in like every other time when he's not on screen it's so boring <laughs> it's basically seven samurai but the medieval version of it it's an okay movie uh, but paul giamatti is the best version of is the best part of that movie but okay. i've already seen it so we will not be talking about that for a while i would like to talk about it because i haven't seen it in a while and it's one that i've wanted to revisit but i don't want to revisit on my own <laughs> okay well i've not seen it so that definitely gives us extra excuse yeah yeah and i remember it fairly well uh, like it's not a movie that i've had difficulty cool. remembering it has really bad okay. cinematography <laughs> the, film, oh. the, 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 the photography and it's kind of weird <laughs> a lot of low uh. angle like running a lot of like low angle um mounted cameras <laughs> No. We're gonna watch it anyway now. You said you wanted to. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> God, I hate that. That's why I can't watch uh Walking Dead. Oh, God. oh that's a whole nother can of worms. So yeah, okay. That this movie's is. really okay, so closing thought. This movie's really good. Please watch it. <laughs> um just watch it for the sake that people need to stop thinking Netflix is dying. Every time they lose, like, yep. a Star Wars movie, their their in-house content is very good. And that last four years of them throwing money at people is really paying off. Because we're getting movies oh, yeah, like this, sure. you know, we're getting movies from Scorsese, we're getting, we got Klaus out of that agreement. So, yeah, I definitely, this has been a really good start of the year for me in terms of movies. I think the weakest one I watched was Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> But I still love that movie because of how crazy it is. But yeah, definitely give this a watch. And definitely, yeah. you've been humming and hawing about your Netflix subscription. Just kind of go watch. Just go see what else is on there. Definitely go watch Klaus, though. I'm going to always tell people to watch that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um. So, and, and my closing thoughts are basically the same. Um. Just go watch it. Let us know what you think. And um, if you want to find more, uh, we're always available uh, as a company on Facebook, uh, which is facebook.com slash Jaded Phoenix Studios. Twitter is uh, at Jaded Phoenix STU. 
Patreon is Jaded Phoenix Studios, and Instagram is also Jaded Phoenix Studios. We like to try and keep things easy for yeah. you guys. Um, KT is available uh, at coneracomics.wordpress.com and on Instagram uh, at conerathax and YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash user slash conerathax. And I am available on Twitch uh, at Quinn. And Instagram is also Zanby Quinn. Yeah, and I also I also had a Patreon as well, but that's just more so if you're interested in my comics. And I did open a Gumroad recently full of lots of original lovely art, so if you want to get your hand on some cute little original ACEO Pokemon cards, I did them. So, yeah, I think we are good to go. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Have a wonderful time. We will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.